one person again. Well, um, so Pastor Lee is in our Uvalde campus, so uh, he's there. Um, but I did want to uh, mention or ask how many of y'all have uh, gone to Fiesta this weekend? Anybody? Okay, so we're all good Christians. I'm just kidding. Um, all righty. I don't know how the second service will go, but um, so if you can turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And this is going to be um, what well, we're going to be focusing on through this whole uh, series. And then it's today, and then Pastor Zach is actually going to be preaching next week. So make sure that you join that. But 2 Peter chapter 1, Simon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. So he has given us everything that we need. Amen? For a godly life through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Though these things he has given us, his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Everyone say divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So there's no excuses of God doesn't provide. Of we can't grow in him. Because his word says so. His word is clear that he gives us everything we need. Sometimes it's us that needs to take the challenge to leap forward. Grace and peace in abundance. What does this look like? We, te we tend to think of grace as just forgiveness. But that is only half the grace, right? Grace is forgiveness, but is also the power released into us when we encounter a God who forgives and loves us despite everything that we do and everything that we've done. It's not like our grace, right, that wavers. His doesn't. To experience grace is to live in the fullness of all God intends to give us. And when we live in abundant grace, there will be abundant peace. The life God gives us comes by grace. And God, through his perfection, we can live in a constant state of peace. Again, he gives us everything that we need. So God is ne never fearful. He is never stressed out or anxious. He is never moved. He is never rude. God is never inconsiderate. God is love, and he is loved. So Peter is teaching us that God wants us to share in his nature, in God's nature, the essence, the being of who he is. And he wants to share that with us, his creation, his sons and daughters, so that we too can live a full life and experience that grace and peace. And I just want to remind y'all that God knows you. He knows you're not perfect. He knows that you mess up. He's not asking per for perfection when you come to him. And a lot of us have that mixed up in our minds that I have to be perfect to come to Christ. We're all broken. All of us. If we weren't broken, we would probably not think to come to church. Because my life is so perfect. But we need him. 
If you're sitting there thinking of all your past, present, and future mistakes or failures, you're doing it wrong. You're not thinking of, of God's grace and the love that he has for us. Because we need you. The church needs people like you. We need your stories. We need your testimonies. We need your mistakes. We need other people to encounter your love because you've gone through it. And maybe I haven't, or maybe I have. And I need your story. People are broken and they need help. They don't need your judgment. They don't need your scorn. They just need you to be there for them, like God is. And when I, I, I thought about this, just to get you a, a clearer picture, imagine you were a bystander just walking down the sidewalk and you witness an awful car crash, right? Terrible. What do you do? Do you go running and, and be like, oh, you didn't check your blind spot? Oh, you didn't see that car coming? You were going too fast. All the while, the people are in pain. No, right? We go to their aid, we help them without judgment. God is working through them. We are the front line, church. People are looking to us first. They're not going to just one day pop open their Bible, read all the way through it. No, they're going to see you. They're going to see your actions. They're going to see how you love or who you dismiss. They're going to see you. So if that's you today, if that's your first instinct is to call people out. We may need to check our heart. We may need to check our heart and see what our real motives are. Because our job is to make disciples of all nations. So I want to talk to you today about participating in the divine nature of God. The best place to assess this very nature of God is with his own words. So let's go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. The context of this passage we will read is a conversation between God and Moses. Actually, Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. God has called Moses to go back to Egypt after having to flee because he had committed murder. Pause. If you're sitting here thinking that you cannot be used by God, he literally used a murderer. Amen? Amen? So all of the things that we've done, he can use that. God wants him to return as a mouthpiece of God in order to set the Israelites free from their slavery to Egypt. And Moses hears God telling him to go and ask God, who shall I send? Say has sent me. Let's read this together. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. God is always looking at us. God is always there for us. God is concerned with us. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I 
that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. That's what we do, right? Who am I? I'm literally a murderer. And you're asking me to do this. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of our fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So the Lord gives Moses two names, right? The first one is I am the I am. Everyone said the I, I am the I am. The second is the God of your fathers. Over the next two weeks, we are going to be discussing this. So today, we're going to discuss the I am the I am. Next week, uh, we'll touch on the God of our fathers. So let's begin with I am that I am. The Lord is using a phrase to describe again his essence and lets us know that his essence is like anything else that our mind is able to comprehend. He is not anything but himself. He is the only one, and the Bible says there is no one like God. No one can compare to him. And his essence isn't like anything of this world. So to share in the divine nature of God is to be distinguished and set apart from this earthly realm. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 44 through 49, it says, If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So we say living being, we see life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven as was the earthly man. So are those who, so are those who are of the earth and is the heavenly man. So also are those of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. The Apostle Paul said that he called his body a tent. So what is a tent? It's something that we go out of our home, we pitch a tent, and it is not forever. It is for a little while. It is for a weekend. It is for a week, whatever it is, but we are not staying there. That's what he's saying, that this earth that we are on, this earthly realm, is temporary. We're not here forever. Our, our permanent home is with Jesus Christ, is with God. And often, a lot of people believe that this is it. This is all we have, so let's make the most out of it. I don't know if you remember a couple years back, everyone saying YOLO, right? You only live once. Not with God. Not with God. So when we have that belief of, oh, let's just 
party up, make it the best we can do right here and not remember the consequences spiritually, physically, whatever it is, then we lose more and more. When we realize this life, this earthly body is temporary, we start to chase after Christ because Christ is forever. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-7. through 7. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in his tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Don't focus on the earthly, worldly. We have been set apart to live with him. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. When Christ came to earth, he declared that heaven was at hand. In other words, he was the heavenly man tented in this earthly body. Heaven had come down in him, and we are to share in this divine nature that he is. God wants our life, our words, our demeanor, our way of moving through this life on earth so that people can get a glimpse of heaven. They can see you and they can see heaven. They can see you, they can see God. They get to see what life will be like one day when we get to spend eternity in heaven. In heaven there is no more suffering, there's no more tears. There's no more pain, no more death, no more worry, stress, fear. None of it. All of the bad things that you can think of that are here, that happen all the time, there is none of that in heaven. We are the hope of heaven appearing right in front of those who need it. You are the hope of heaven to your family, to your children, to your neighbors, to your coworkers. And God is calling you to share in his divine nature. God wants to use you to reach other people like he used other people to reach us. Our life should entice those around us to chase after God. I want what you have. And even though our life is imperfect, it's filled with peace. It's filled with joy because of Christ. As much as Christ made a difference in your life, God is calling you to make a difference in somebody else's life. As much as Christ enjoyed the peace, power, love, and joy of God, he wants you to share in the same. The Lord reveals his nature to be self-sufficient. So he refers to himself as I am. His essence, then, is found in his existence. 
but because his existence is not like anything else that can be replicated or found in this world, he exists uniquely. There is only one of him. So he is self-sufficient. It's not dependent on anything. He doesn't need anything else to be him. So he is self-sufficient. So let's think about this. Let's say I build a chair and I put it in my kitchen. And when I walk out or leave, that chair is still going to be there. That's not God. Without him, we are nothing. There is nothing good about us because he is our creator. Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Everything depends on him, from the air we breathe, to the water that we drink, to the stars that we gaze. Every single thing is dependent on him, as we are, as we should be. The, ba the Bible si says that all things hold together in him. This means that nothing has been created or has, or has been created that, released, that has been released to be independent. Everything in God's creation continues to be dependent on him. He needs nothing, but everything exists because he holds it together. So when we think about that, why should we be afraid of anything? Since he is our heavenly father, he protects us. He has an umbrella over us. Psalms chapter 27, verse 1 through 5, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. I used to be so afraid of what my life will be, what my life will turn out like. So afraid of not knowing where I would end up. Not knowing what the step is or, or this failure that I did in my life. Or what if something awful happened? But with God... That has washed me, washed off of me. You find this overwhelming sense of peace and direction and calmness that everything's going to be okay because he is with me and he is for me. And I do want to say, because when you hear this sometimes, at least this was me when I heard this talk, taught, um, I would say, oh, oh, then it must be an immediate thing. Boom, boom. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a process. As you trust and obey him, it's a process. So you have to keep going. You have to keep going. Mine was more as a process. It wasn't boom, boom. It was step 
by step by step without giving up. Sure, I might have walked, fell, stumbled, tripped many times, but the difference is I got up and I kept going and I kept moving and I kept pushing forward. I didn't listen to the enemy. I didn't listen to the voices that said, you're not good enough. I just kept going. And I'm doing a heck of a lot better than where I was. And that I owe all to God. And the people that he used to minister to me. So I just want you to remember progression. Progression, not perfection. He is looking for progress, not your perfect self. God is calling us to be self-sufficient in him. Our ego in this natural man, this natural body, is delicate and easily moved. The natural man needs affirmation from others because we need this affirmation. We stress, worry, dance, and tiptoe trying to get everyone's approval. But the heavenly man needs nothing. The heavenly body needs absolutely nothing because our worth is in him. The heavenly man is confident of who they are in Christ, so they do not need anyone else to build them up. The heavenly man is convinced that they have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That is our truth. Let our enemies strike against us. Let our critics attack our reputations. Let our friends betray us because guess what? God is on our side. And that's all that matters. At the end of the day, they will not succeed. God will. I want you to say this. I am a child of God. We are all children of God. No one can take that away. And if you believe that, if you believe that you are a child of God and that nobody can take that away, say amen. amen. The nature of his existence means he can never be anything he is not. So he never changes. We do. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The natural body, in an attempt to be affirmed by others, is prone to inconsistent behavior. Things happen and we react to those things. Our values change, our purpose changes, our attractions change. We go from fitting into one group to go to another group. We change to meet our environment. We are all manic depressive at some level. We lose our temper. One day we are awesome, and the next day we're not. And that sh I want to show you that because that's what the heavenly, uh, the earthly body is, not the heavenly body. But God doesn't change. But when we participate in His divine nature. Our values, goals, identity, and peace are set in him. The Lord is wanting to give us his essence so that we cannot be shaken. Our stability will be derived from heaven, not earth. Fear will not shake us. Stress will not shake us. People will not shake us. Pandemics, recessions, wars, and rumors of wars will not Shake us because we are standing firm in him. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So our character will remain intact. The issues of life will not sway us. 
We will not be swayed by the cunning and craftiness of the enemy. We will not be controlled by what others do by losing our temper, falling into depression, running, and hiding. Our confidence will be in whose we are and who he is. He is the great I am so that we can be who he has called us to be. Our consistency is his consistency. What we put in is what we receive. So are you putting in the work? Are you putting in the work? And not to say that God doesn't bless those who aren't. He has so many blessings to give. But think about all those blessings that you're missing out on that your family's missing out on. We have to trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. When we don't, we aren't fully allowing him to completely work in us. We are just getting by from the bare minimum. There is more out there, I promise you that there is. If you think your life is good, keep going. Because it's only going to get better with Christ. And a lot of us think that we can do it by ourselves. We get to a point where it's like, okay, God, I got it from here. I got it from here. but we have to let him use us, cleanse cleanse us. If you're living, think of it like this, if you're living partially for the world and partially for God, he can't trust you with things of his kingdom. And it's not personal. It's not personal to you. He's holding back these things. So when you step and step and step, it's like, okay, here, here's this. And then it just keeps going. It just keeps going. When we attach ourselves to the things of this world, we are pushing God away, saying that I got this. I can do this by myself, God. I'll call you when I need you again. We can't cheat on God. We can't cheat on him. So I bought this thing, (laughs) it's funny because I've only used it one time, I bought this thing for my back the other day because I have terrible posture when I'm sitting down, i all hunched over. Um, And let me tell you what, that was the most annoying, uncomfortable thing ever. And it would buzz every time like I would move my head and so it would buzz every second because I have terrible posture. But why was it annoying and uncomfortable? Because my posture was awful. So of course it would be annoying. So when we think about it, and our heart posture is terrible, or not the same, then, it, then the, the things of God are uncomfortable and annoying. But when we push through it and our posture starts to get better, little by little, it won't annoy us. And guess what? Our posture is straightened. And that reminds me, I have to put that thing back on this Monday. (sighs) When we chase God truly, we will love ourselves consistently. We will no longer beat ourselves up over the tiniest issue. We will not judge ourselves based on whether we do good or not. Our love will remain even when we have the biggest fail. We will not let others walk all over us, but we will set healthy, healthy boundaries. We will love God with all of our hearts. And we will become a safe place for others. They will know, regardless of what they might do, even to us, that they will still be loved. And that's hard. 
but God is with us. So it's made easier. And sometimes it's not. But that's when we have to trust and obey. They will know the love may be unpleasant and tough or lavished, la lavished in goodness, but it will always be love. Their safety in our love will draw them to us. And for those who are too prideful to handle the tough love, they will stray far from us. Our emotional stability will allow us to make a greater difference in those who can handle the truth and also protect us from those too prideful to see they are not perfect. And I'm going to be honest with you today. If you, are, if you can't handle tough love, if you can't handle accountability, this might not be the place for you. Because we preach and we teach that this is a place that we are going to love you into a loving relationship with God. The second part is key. The second part is key. And because it is key, because God is perfect, sometimes we have to step aside in a lovingly way and say, hey, I want the best for you, and this is why I'm bringing this up to you. If you are having a hard time with this, let me help you. Maybe you need to step back from, from whatever it is that you're doing. And maybe we need some prayer time. Maybe we need some devotional time. We're never going to just let you go. Because we want you to grow. We, we, this place, what we're aiming to do is to be a place of transformation and growth. And that's what I want you to know. We truly want to see you grow in church. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 7 through 8, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. God is with you. He will never leave you. He wants you to grow. We want you to grow. He wants you to participate in this divine nature. My last point, and I just want to end with this uh, verse that we read. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior in Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires for this very reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness.
and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord, Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you can stand up with me. If you can close your eyes. And I just want you to remind you again today that it's not perfection that he is seeking from you. It's a willing heart. to humble ourselves and say that we can't do this alone. We can't do this life alone. With your eyes closed, just want you to, to ask yourself, are you tired? Are you tired of stumbling through this life? Are you tired of going through the motions? Are you tired of being angry? And if you want to make that decision of allowing him to work, of choosing him, I just want you to repeat after me. <laughs> Father, I choose you to come into my heart to change and cleanse me so that I can be a devout follower of you. I give you complete control. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let me pray for you, church. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for everything that I've gone through. Because it has led me to here. God, I thank you for the people that have been there for me. that have had to use tough love on, love on me. Because it has led to here. And God, if anybody is struggling today, I pray that you cover them with a warm embrace and tell them that it will be okay. Pick them up, shake off the dust, and tell them to keep going, because it's not over yet. Thank you for being a good, good father. We love you, Lord. We pray that we can be 
difference makers. We pray that we can be a light to those around us. In your holy name we pray. Everyone said, amen. And just a quick thing before I get off. Um, uh, if you ever need somebody to speak to, I'm here. Zach's here. Pastor Lisa Valde, but he'll come back. <laughs> We have a, a, a prayer team that is here to serve you. Amen. So you can always come, and you're always welcome. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. It's a good message this morning. Amen. We need to learn to, to partner with God and push through and allow His Spirit to move in and perfect us. Amen? Amen. Um, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we are excited that you're here. Uh, we would like to get to know you a little bit. We have a gift for you, and you can actually uh, go out to the Welcome Center out in the front, and there's somebody there to meet with you um, and give you that gift. It is uh, one of Pastor Lee's books. Uh, Pastor Lee is our lead pastor that you did not get to see today, um, but he is in Uvalde. He'll be back next week. Or actually, that's not true. He's going to be in Albuquerque mm -hmm. next week. So he'll be back in two weeks. Um, so, but if you go on our website, he's the bald-headed guy that you can see there if you want to see his face, okay? Um, I say that in love. He is my dad. Um, but if it is your first time, we'd like to get to know you. Uh, before I absolutely let us go, Vanessa has one thing to say. Well, fresh start bags, too. Oh, and the fresh start bags. <laughs> see, I don't know what I'm doing. This is Sarah's <laughs> job, and she's not here. Yeah. Okay? Not that yet, <laughs> Nikki. You're jumping the gun, okay? If, if you did say that prayer with Vanessa today and you accepted Christ into your heart for the first time, we have some bags over here called the Fresh Start Bags. They have a de devotional reading plan, a New Testament in there for you, and a couple other things to help you get started on your journey, okay? Um, because if you did say that prayer today, I want you to know that that wasn't the end. That was the beginning, right? And everything that Pastor Vanessa preached about today is the, the next part. Okay, and so we want to get uh, help you in that journey. So if you did say that prayer today or you rededicated your life today, we would like for you to grab one of those bags on the way out. Now Vanessa has something that she needs to say. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, some cupcakes for the celebration of Zach's ordination. And thank you, Nikki. Um, our mission here is to love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, y'all are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.